Hello everyone, welcome to the future. In this future, you have more freedom to be untethered. You can use your VDI with your software and settings and travel from one machine to the next, whether it be a physical machine running Windows or if you have OS X or a mobile device running Android or iOS. For the purposes of today's video, we're going to demonstrate Office 1080p video gaming and CAD related applications. So. I'm running Camtasia to record this on my computer while I remote into this personalized VDI. However, you could just as easily connect, like I said, from any device. So I have used uh, an iOS iPad Air in order to connect up to this. And as you can see, I'm running my Windows 7 background while I connect it to this Windows 8.1 guest here. So let's just get right to it, shall we? Um, we're going to show this particular VDI which is running uh, Hyper-V with GPU acceleration and the possibility of replacing traditional machines with it. Um, what that means is that the server you're connecting to has a bunch of computers running on it at the same time with accelerated content and that gives you um, reliability and it gives you scalability at the same time. So as you can see for this particular computer here, um, let's go ahead and jump to system see it's got about 4 gigs of memory running 64-bit Windows 8.1 and uh, you can see that it's remote FX and that's the GPU acceleration from basically using the server's uh, graphic card. You can see it's got a virtual drive and it just has two basic processors here. So really this computer is no different than the one that you would give your parents or your grandparents. It's very lightweight, very easy, uh, very cheap at most places. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to check out Office and then 1080p video and then we're going to do uh, some gaming and some CAD like I said. So let's go ahead and start with something like Microsoft Word. Now I know for those of you that know VDIs this is very basic but the importance of this for some people is to show latency. So this is a test, oh, don't test it. this is a test to show how long and responsive the system is while I type. And then if I let's see if I want to pull that and make this bigger. Can you read this properly? Can you see any uh, screen tearing? So for the most part, this looks pretty good. And as you can see, I can just go ahead and demonstrate out all of this. So. Office seems fine. It's very lightweight, very easy. You could do that with almost any computer in the world. That's not a big deal. Um, but let's go ahead and, and try pushing it a little bit higher. Let's use something like uh, Chrome to look at some 1080p content inside of YouTube. And then we'll try looking at QuickTime to see what QuickTime looks like. So let's go ahead and uh, look at the Tron Legacy trailer. Um, let's see here. So what we're looking for, turn off annotations. What we're looking for here is the smoothness of the video, uh, the brightness, the coloring, and the buffering capability. So, the video content is fairly smooth. Um, you can look at the lip syncing. You can see the pores, so it's obviously HD content. So, what this shows is that this is one of the more punishing aspects of being able to virtualize a desktop computer inside a server and connecting up to it. Because the transport mechanism, if you will, the when you use RDP, as most people know, to connect up to it, it doesn't allow you to do graphical acceleration. Um, so in this case, because of using Hyper-V and some of the optimizations we've done to it, it does allow for it. So as you can see, I can jump around in here, so it's not necessarily a buffering. And you can see that slow motion particle effects work, so everything looks pretty smooth. And this would be great for most podiums and classrooms um, in most universities for a lot of the professors that show some of their lecture content material online. So let's go ahead and uh, stop this and we'll open up and do something like QuickTime trailers. Now QuickTime is notorious for for those sysadmins out there and desktop technicians out there for being very problematic in terms of wanting to do automatic updates, uh, not tying into browsers properly. 
So this is much better, and surprisingly, it's better than a lot of uh, desktop computers out there. The eye on that gives me nothing but pain. And I so as you can see, you can see Tom Cruise's hair waving in the wind, his shirt moving. Joining countermeasures. Explosions are pretty crisp. Chaos. The time has come to dissolve it's, uh, the IMF. It's pretty good. And I want you to see it's uh, it's very, very good actually. You can see the smoke in the background. What are the times? The blurriness of it. Last I heard, he was tracking his. So, system. let's go ahead and just get out of this now, and we'll just jump straight ahead right field. into gaming. Now, gaming is important because it's going to stress test the system in all aspects video and 3D acceleration and even latency, uh, drive speed, memory, things like that. So down here I have Steam installed and I put a few different games on here. So let's start with some of the lighter games like Magic and we'll work our way up to Borderlands. So Magic the Gathering is a card game that came out early 1990s, a long time ago. And uh, in, terms of, in terms of the... I'm able to connect with the Steam Cloud, that's interesting. Um, in terms of this, it's uh, a 2D game with elements of 3D because of shadows and particle effects, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump in. Down here, you can see the counter from Steam that shows how many frames per second you're getting. Um, for relation, if you were at a movie theater and you were watching uh, a standard film reel, that would be about 24 frames per second. So generally speaking, anything over 20 FPS is going to be playable. Not great, but playable. Um, in order for the human eye to no longer distinguish the ability to see video moving anymore, it can't typically be higher than about 60 frames a second in terms of uh, a lot of content, or even up to 120 max. So as you can see here, I'm moving around the cards. I can zoom in, and everything is fast and responsive. So I'm not going to play a full game. I'm just going to play a, a couple rounds, and we'll see. That way you can see the smoothness of the bar going across. You can see some of the particle effects. Again, some of the smoothing. You can see the little real-time meter. It's just calculating it. Some particle effects that are going on with that card. bar opens up, it's attacking, and I have nothing to defend, and it ends. So at this point, you can see the part of effects. I'm going to go ahead and close this, and we'll just go ahead because of uh, the time that's consumed at this point, and we'll just jump to the next game. So we've looked at that. Now let's go ahead and do something like Torchlight 2. Torchlight 2 is almost like a Diablo game, if those of you that are familiar with that. I essentially, it's a hack and slash isometric over the over the shoulder or overhead style game. So while this is loading up here, I'm going to go ahead and start the task manager so you can kind of see some of the resources that are going. So as you're looking around here, you can see that the CPU, oh, I must not be, I must be offline. As you can see, the CPU is pretty lightweight. The memory, disk, everything is pretty easy. So, if you remember from earlier, there were two CPUs and four gigs of memory in here. So what that tells you is that you're not even using one CPU because that would basically be 50%. So, that's pretty impressive. So, let's go ahead and just resume our game. Well, it said 18 frames per second, but this is a static window right here. All right, so I'm in game now. So as you can see, we're getting 45 frames per second, and uh, it's quite responsive. You can see all the little particle effects that are going. As you can see, oh. going to finish this one encounter here. That way you can see what's going on. Read 
Archer needs food badly. Green Archer is about to die. So, as you can see, this is completely playable. It's quite good. And it's a consistent 40 frames per second. So, at this point, let's go ahead and uh, quit out of here. So let's just go ahead and jump uh, to Just Cause 2, and then we'll our last game will be Borderlands 2. So Just Cause 2 is essentially, think of it like John McClane from the Die Hard movies being dropped off in a foreign country causing mayhem and destruction. This game actually runs incredibly smooth for the basic amount of resources that we've given it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just look around here just so you can kind of see it. So right now we're getting about 60 frames per second. And that way you can kind of see the, uh, the grass rendering. So the only real issue isn't the server-side rendering of this at 48 frames per second. It's more of the the latency and the screen redraw based on the the protocol, if you're if you will. So this is basically using RDP, um, and RDP is a robust but kind of an aging technology for connecting up to machines. Uh, PCYP from Teradici, for example, is uh, a little bit newer, um, a lot more superior. But, for the purposes of this demonstration, it gets it done. And the purposes of this VDI aren't particularly for gaming. It's just to show the possibility of the future, if you will. So, let's see, get on top here. Let's see if I can actually find someone for you to actually see what it looks like in terms of a match. Here we go. Ouch. <laughs> Alright, 100 meters away. Here we go. Alright. So there is a little bit of latency as you're playing. But again, this is basically to show the possibility of what you can do. And I forgot how to actually start the... Oh, wow. My character died. So, at that point, you get the idea. You can play. I'm going to go ahead and go directly to uh, Borderlands 2 at this point. And then uh, we'll show some CAD-related content. Okay, so that's closed. So let's start... Borderlands 2. Borderlands is a very popular game. Um, it's a apocalyptic game set in a cel-shaded style, as you can see, where it's not. It's kind of like cartoony, but not. And you can see it's 49 frames per second down here. I don't have an internet connection at this point. I think that's why it's kind of lagging out, so my apologies for that. Okay. So, let me get my calibrations here. As I said, uh, the problem isn't necessarily the frames per second. It's uh, the sensitivity of the mouse and keyboard. You almost need to use some sort of um, way to lag it out or make it a little bit less responsive because it's too responsive in many ways. But if you, you can see the counter here, I'm getting 13 frames per second. So it's, it's a little sluggish. But it is playable. Well, somewhat playable. Dr. Zed, the clinic. 
So this video card in the server is an Ation, uh, an ATI S1000 uh, Fire Pro, I believe. So it's almost like a basic desktop card, but it's server grade, meaning you can share it out with a lot of resources. So you could very easily put in a more robust video card, and that would also allow it to um, help out with 3D rendering, for example. If I can actually, Thor is my nemesis. Hello, no people in this place. Hello, how are you? So. I'm gonna go ahead and in this demonstration and we'll go to the of gaming and we'll go check out some of the office productivity. So the three other apps that I'm gonna be demonstrating now are uh, Google SketchUp, um, AutoCAD, and uh, Rhino. So let's go ahead and show some of those. So let's show uh, Google SketchUp. Google SketchUp is a freeware program um, that allows you to basically build almost any sort of object you can think of. Think of it like Minecraft for adults, I guess. So you can see I'm going to dynamically shrink and make this bigger. And then you can kind of make an object here. And then you can push and pull at your heart's desire. And oops, sorry. Let's make this dynamic. Just a little bit big, pull you out. And what you're seeing is that I am in real time, let me even make that out, out of the constraints. I'm making this um, able to do everything quite easily. Um, it's not the system slowing you down at this point, it's only your own imagination in your own mind. So let's go ahead and close out SketchUp. And let's jump to the really big boy. Where's AutoCAD? There you are. So there's a lot of architecture students um, at many universities. And in this way, we could uh, showcase the flexibility that if there was an AutoCAD club or you have some people from a particular frat or a dorm, they could all work together if they were taking AutoCAD and um, have, a, have a greater sense of collaboration. Let's go ahead and do mine. Now, I am by no means an AutoCAD expert. I have not taken AutoCAD classes in a really long time. <laughs> but uh, I'm just trying to trying to showcase what it looks like in real time. Just so you can kind of get an idea that of screen tearing um, and what it what's going on in this case. The way it's uh, live demos are good in that regard that you can kind of see that there's no doctoring necessarily. So that's my, this is my abstract masterpiece that I've done in here. Um, there are, let's see here, I think there's some samples. Sample files, install sample files. Sample, sample. that bigger so you can kind of see that AutoCAD works it, it would give you a lot of freedom to be able to uh, to use it and it's fairly responsive again on two CPUs and four gigs of memory which you could easily scale out to have more resources uh, Rhino is another one Rhino is um, it's like AutoCAD but it has a lot of open source elements to it for a community that will create additional options, which is which is pretty interesting. There are a lot of plugins. Think of it like if you've played Skyrim, think of it like Skyrim with all of the different mods you can get from uh, from Boss. So let's go ahead and um, see what I can build here. The interesting thing about this is obviously you can see what it's rendering out in 3D. You can see the different perspectives. this, oops, get this, uh -huh. let me see, so at this point I think you get the idea, if you look at the right screen, 
can see what it looks like as it's doing everything. Behold, the power of a line. So let's go ahead and close out Rhino. And uh, the only other, these are computational statistical. So essentially you could render out a lot of math equations and stuff on the fly, which is pretty neat. Um, Google Earth, another freeware application that lets you virtually travel, if you will. Welcome to Google Earth. Hello. So, hello world. Go down here. You can see we're scaling. You can see the world is shaking. It's not normally you would you would see kind of like a tearing on the edges if I was shaking it. It would be kind of like black lines, but you're not seeing that here. So that shows the power of the the acceleration at work. You can see that we're in Houston. Hello. From above. You can see it's rendering out everything. I want to absolutely zoom in down here. You can see it's uh this graphic card's pretty good. It's fairly well. Now keep in mind this VDI is on a server housed in a data center with a pretty robust connection. Um, so essentially I'm piggybacking off of its pipe to the world. And as I zoom out we will go ahead and end that. So again, because this is on a server, that means that if there was a mechanical failure, uh, the VDI would still be accessible. Um, because it's virtualized, it also means you can scale it out and give it um, additional processing power or RAM. So this had four gigs of memory, but the server itself could dynamically scale it out to easily give it all of the system memory. This server has 256 gigs of memory on it, so if it absolutely had to, you could theoretically give it almost 256 gigs of memory, provided the other uh, VDIs on it aren't using it. Now, that also lets you to render out some jobs quicker for AutoCAD, for example. So now that you've seen um, 1080p video and QuickTime and some office productivity, um, you've seen some CAD-related CAD programs and some Steam, I hope you can see the uh, possibilities for faculty, staff, and students. Students could essentially work on projects collaboratively from anywhere, like a dorm or a coffee house. Uh, they could use a MacBook, PC laptop, or tablet to connect and develop uh, together, which is kind of nice. Faculty who work on new curriculum and assignments while they're home with their families without having to go to work on a weekend or a weeknight. And it also means that, let's say they get a new idea, they could just log into their VDI from any device and just append to their idea to their personalized desktop. So, future untethered. Users have the potential for the greatest creative freedom right at their fingertips. And uh, with that, I hope you guys have a great afternoon or a great day and uh, to be continued.